Hey, good morning everyone. Good morning and welcome to our fourth episode of I Married a Mystic. And the topic this morning is mystical experiences as an effect of forgiveness. And um, this is the topic that I mean, we could spend a whole week on. In fact, we could spend a whole lifetime <laughs> on this topic of forgiveness and the effects of forgiveness and mystical experiences. So we'll just explore it this morning and, and see where it takes us. I, I always like to start at the beginning. So right at the beginning of the course, uh, Jesus teaches that uh, love is beyond that which can be taught. And so mystical experience in itself is not our goal. Um, the goal is the peace of God and, and yet what can be taught is forgiveness. What can be learned is, is forgiveness. Um, you can learn how to pray how to discern the difference between the ego's voice and the Holy Spirit's voice. Uh, you can learn about true empathy and the unhealed healer and about the dynamics of the ego. And you can learn about the, the thought patterns in your own mind and, and learn how to um, bring the direction of your thinking towards forgiveness and towards the Holy Spirit. All of that is, is very practical and essential um, to bring the mind to the present where the healing can happen. And so mystical experiences in themselves are not something that you have any control over uh, of when they happen or how they happen or if they happen. Um, but I would really like to share about mystical experience because They are a glimpse and a reminder of our true nature. They, they are glimpses of remembering oneness, remembering spiritual identity. And, and so all of the work that's being done to loosen the mind from identity with the ego um, is is the forgiveness and the unlearn unlearning and the letting go and through that letting go um, then the mind can have a, an experience of, of something that's beyond that. So. I'm just going to start by talking about our true nature a little bit. Our identity is actually an idea in the mind of God. So the mind of God, you could say, or the kingdom of heaven is a presence of love, a spiritual reality, and spiritual is just a word. <laughs> These are all just words, um, and many words have different connotations and associations for different people. So it's always good to use different languages and different words um, and to come at things in different angles so that if there's a hook or a catch with a certain word, we can come at it another way to go beyond it. Because the purpose of words is to point to something that is beyond them always. You know, we do the best we can to describe with the words, but ultimately they're never going to be it. So even the word spiritual, to say we have a spiritual reality, that's just basically saying um, perceptual reality or the world of form, the, the, what is concretized um, or can be perceived is not spiritual in itself. You could say there's, one is perceptual in form and can be seen and one is spiritual or Another word for spiritual is presence. Um, like when you see with the vision of Christ, 
which is also a goal of the Course of Miracles in any spiritual path. Um, to see with the vision of Christ is, is to see with your heart, is to see with your intuition, is to know, to know in a way that resonates as truth, as opposed to relying on like the body's senses to tell you what you need to uh, see or to recognize. So it's turning towards the spirit in the mind or turning towards um, an, an inner direction to be told what is happening and who we are. So this is all the direction of the thinking to bring the mind towards spiritual reality as opposed to um, living based on the past, based on past experience or based on the thinking of the world. So our true identity is an idea in the mind of God and that idea is a thought of love. That idea is a thought of peace. And it's a beautiful thought when you think of that. And if you think of everyone you know, they are the thought of love. They are the thought of innocence. They can be a reminder for you of who you are as an idea in the mind of God. And if you have a thought of someone or a memory of someone that is something other than a thought of Christ or a thought of innocence, then there's forgiveness work to be done. To know who you are as the thought of Christ, as spirit, as opposed to a personality identity. So, this practice with forgiveness of being willing to bring any perception of ourself or another as being anything other than innocent in for forgiveness, um, that is what will loosen your identity um, as the personality self in this world. And so that's how it all becomes for me. You know, that's why forgiveness is always for me. It's a gift I'm giving myself to release what I think about another. So, mystical experiences, they are an effect of when identity as being a limited or solid sense of self just loosens up and gives way. And in that moment, in that um, awareness, there can be a glimpse where there can be, you just see things differently. And for myself, I've had many different experiences. Some of them are um, still perceptual, where uh, you can still see things in form as opposed to just seeing nothing but white light. Um, and I have friends who have just described all kinds of different experiences, um, flashes of white light, and Jesus even describes that in the Course that you may start to see white light around the edges of things and this is, this is quite natural too. And it's just a reflection that you're loosening in your mind from judgment. Because judgment is what holds a concrete idea in your mind of what everything is as a separate object. And as that loosens from the mind, then it's almost like this light is coming into your mind and softening everything up around the edges <laughs> so that you're no longer operating from the sense of and I know mind based on the past and based on my past experiences of everything being separate and how I relate to that, you know, as, a, as an object and a subject, as if we are apart. So there's a, 
like even a scene in The Matrix, if you've watched The Matrix, of when Neo is offered the red pill or the blue pill, and that is very symbolic of being offered um, the decision, do you want to wake up? Do you really want to know <laughs> what the matrix is um, or not? And he says, yes, I do. And very shortly after that decision is made clearly in his mind, he looks to the side and he sees a mirror beside him on the wall. And all of his previous experiences with mirrors, like everyone else in this world, it's a solid object. You look at it, it directly reflects what's in front of it. But in this moment, after he's made the decision to wake up and see the matrix for what it is, it wobbles. Yeah. And then he even reaches out to touch it, and it's like, whoa, the whole thing is liquid. It's not what it previously was in his experience. So that's just an example of, of it can seem like the outside world to you is no longer what it once was and after these kind of glimpses it's uh, you really never the same again you you don't look upon the world as being the way that it has always been it's not this solid form based um, witness of separation it just starts to all merge in together until ultimately you just experience that there's a softness surrounding you. It really is more like a dream state where everything is around you and yet your mind is not just going around judging everything as being separate objects in and of themselves. They're just the soft surroundings as you're flowing in your life as spirit and everything that's surrounding you can be of support in your in your healing and in your awakening. It's all here just as a gentle backdrop as you're opening your mind ever deeper to awareness of oneness where there is nothing but the love of God and that which is here to support being with God. So for myself I'd experienced a lot of deep within meditation, just dropping into um, awareness, like a vast awareness within my mind in meditation, where I would just let myself fall and let myself drop. And they were beautiful experiences. I could almost call them visions where I could feel and see within my mind's eye. It was like just an ocean. And at times the ocean was was had different colors and I would feel myself just merging into this awareness that there is nothing but this ocean of awareness deep within my mind and then the more um, open-eyed experiences <laughs> um, I noticed that they happened after quite often after I'd been going through a lot of deep healing and letting go of the self-concept and they were like a reflection of of a big letting go and a big loosening where I'd surrendered I come to a complete surrender point of like well okay I'm not in control of my life and shortly after that I would find myself like my mind would just pop open and an experience Experience um, of that, which is in the book, was when I traveled down to Colombia with David, and even on the way down there, it was um, I had the fear of death arising, and for some reason I I'd never really been afraid of death or been aware that I was afraid of death, but before we got on the plane, I started to have these images of being decapitated and it was very intense and we had a, a flight all the way down to Colombia and the, in the intensity just came up until the point where I was yeah very pale and David just held my hand and um, and we went through this whole experience and 
and got down there to Colombia and, and by the time I got there, like the whole thing had shifted and my whole experience when I was there in Colombia was nothing but love. You know, from the moment we arrived at the airport, um, friends came to greet us and they were just so, so happy to have us there and um, host Course in Miracles gatherings. I think we had about four or five a week over the month that we were there. Um, but during that time when I was there, I went through facing jealousy for the first time in my life. I'd never experienced jealousy. I didn't think I was a jealous person. And when I was there, the, literally what felt like a big green monster came up <laughs> and was latching on and calling David my mystic, <laughs> not wanting to share him with anybody else. And it was, yeah, it was a time of working it. And even right towards almost the end of our stay there, um, some plan Bs were coming up in my mind and I was thinking about New Zealand and, you know, I want to... I want an easier ride, you know, it would be much easier if I could just go back to the past. And, uh, and then my ex-boyfriend from England emailed me right when I was thinking about him. We hadn't been in touch for two years, you know, and then I, I got to walk through that experience. Wow, do I really want to go back to the past? And <laughs> um, So all of this deep healing was taking place in my mind as I was going through the darkness, you know, through the darkness in my mind and and facing it and towards right towards the very end of our stay I'd moved through all of this and stayed the course I just kept my hand in David's all the way and come right through it and then we were invited to a, a coffee park Juan Valdez coffee park and uh, Right as we got there, I can just describe it rather than reading it, I think. We went into the coffee park and it was like a big um, botanical garden. And I talked, I love coffee and so I said to David, oh yeah, I would love to have a coffee at the coffee park. And uh, he said, oh, I wonder if they have ice cream. He said, yeah, I could have an ice cream. And then we went walking up to the little cafe within the coffee park and I just started going into this mystical experience where everything around me started to become very dreamy. And we came to the, cof the cafe and I looked up and I couldn't read anything on the board. And I just looked at David and he looked me in the eyes and he just nodded and went, oh, okay, you're having one of those experiences. <laughs> and so he... He ordered me a coffee because earlier I'd said that that's what I would have and he ordered himself an ice cream and and then he just took me by the hand and we just continued going for a little walk in this amusement park and apparently I looked like I was about five years old, just a little girl with her little cafe, little coffee and our friends were there and one of them came up and started to talk to me and and it sounded to me like she was underwater. I couldn't understand anything that was being said. And at first I was a little frightened. I was like, oh, do I need to know something? And uh, David just said, we'll follow you, we'll catch up. And so our friends walked ahead and we just walked behind. And, and I just held his hand as we walked through these botanical gardens. And it was a beautiful experience of being shown that in the letting go, it, it is such a childlike experience. You really do feel like a little child with your hand in the hand of God and that you're going to be taken care of you know, in this experience. And sure enough, there was nothing was expected of me. I didn't need to do anything. I didn't need to understand what anybody was even saying in that moment. All I was to do was just be. You know? Just be in the garden. <laughs> so these experiences, and I've had many, many since then, and every one of them has been an experience of being shown that it's safe. It's safe to let go. 
and that you will be held in the moment. They, they don't, they've never come upon me uh, in a moment where I was personally responsible for something. And if I had that thought in the moment, oh my God, then everything was taken care of by grace in that moment so that I could stay in the deep experience with God. So another um, experience of that, which is just so profound, was uh, when Ricky and I were traveling and I'd been dropping into these very deep experiences. And at first, um, when I first started to drop into them, I would notice some fear came up of, oh, what will happen to me if I dare to drop even deeper into this? And I saw the thought, I won't be able to move. And then I just relax, and then I would hear from within, oh, but you don't need to move. <laughs> okay, that's right, of course. And so I would just allow myself to drop into these ever deeper experiences that I think in Indian terms are called samadhi. Um, and it's just a dropping to the point where you know, if you imagine that you were a puppet on strings, you know, and imagine that you were a puppet on the Holy Spirit's strings, and if the Holy Spirit's got the crossbow, and so he just is there to move you when you're to be moved, you know, and dance you when you're to be danced, <laughs> and talk you when you're to talk. And then when he puts the crossbow down, then that's when you're just to be, and just to relax, and trust that in that moment, you're to allow yourself to, to just flop like a puppet, you know. Just how you would see a puppy or a kitten when they've been playing and it's time to rest, they're out like a light. And, and so that's the trust that's being developed, that truly when I, am have, when I have the energy it's given me and when I'm not to move, I can allow myself to completely rest. So Ricky and I went traveling this time and we were catching a flight and uh, we had two flights to catch and we, we caught the first flight and I think we were in Atlanta airport and then we were going to catch our onward flight and we were in the airport and we went into a cafe and I sat down on the couch and I could feel this feeling of dropping into a deeper mystical experience coming on. And I sat there, I was like, oh, this is the most comfortable couch in the whole world. I would never want to leave this couch. <laughs> that was the feeling. And Ricky was like, oh, oh, okay, this is fine when we're at the monastery, and this is fine when we're at the Peace House, but we're in an airport. <laughs> we have a plane to catch. And uh, so she walked ahead to the, the next... Um, airport lounge area, the gate, where we were to catch the next flight. And she said, you just wait here and I'll come and get you at the last minute. And so I just dropped in and relaxed and, yeah, I closed my eyes and in the cafe. And then when it was time to come to board the plane, she came and got me and we just she just helped me very slowly walk through the airport. And we got there and you know what Jesus did for us? <laughs> because he says that he will rearrange time and space for the miracle worker. And he's not kidding. When you give your life over to the Holy Spirit, to serving God, he will arrange time and space for you. Our plane was canceled and we were offered to stay in an airport hotel that night and catch the flight the next morning. And our gathering wasn't until the following night and so that was the most perfectly arranged plan you can imagine. So these are the kind of experiences you can expect. You can expect these kind of miracles where you can dare to put God first and dare to keep putting this calling first and be shown that everything will be taken care of 
for you, arranged for you by one who loves you. Yes, these promises are true. Here's a text chat. They sure are. Yeah. And I think at first when these experiences come, because they're so different, you know, they're so different to what we've been used to and how we've been used to perceiving the world and, and operating within the world, as if we truly are responsible for our own life and for making sure everything happens and goes according to the plan as we understand it. That when you have an experience like this, initially it's it's a contrast. It's such a big contrast that it can bring up fear, you know, of like, oh, will I be safe in this? Will I be safe in, in the letting go of control? And I think other times when, yeah, at first when it, when it would come on. I'm just remembering another time when I was sitting at a retreat and eye gazing with a friend outside. We'd all been sitting around a campfire and I was eye gazing with him and um, we just sort of softly fell into this deep eye gazing experience where we just didn't feel to move. It just felt very, very restful. And then it just slowly, it very softly started to rain around us and everyone else went inside and we just stayed. And, and then everything started to dissolve into white light, um, sort of from here in my vision all the way around towards him, just fading as if like this big white soft cloud was enveloping everything in it, all the way around to the point where he was the only thing left, and then I could start to feel some fear, like, oh, everything's disappearing, <laughs> what's going to happen? Oh. And he just stayed there and nodded, and I could feel that it wasn't even my friend who was there nodding, it was the Holy Spirit within him, just staying there and nodding, saying, stay with me. Just stay with me. This is safe. Just stay and allow. And then he too just disappeared into light until all that I could see was just like this sort of glowing area where his face had been. And I could sense that there were eyes there, but really just that there was this presence there just staying, saying to me, just stay, stay, allow. And then at some point, sort of form started coming back into awareness. And we left and went back inside. And again, these are just these sort of glimpses of awareness that, that have shown me that what is a form is, is really just a veil. It's it's just a veil of what can be seen and what is believed in. And it's very thin. And when you're aware of it being very thin, it's, it's very light. You know? It's like existence or life just becomes very light because you're no longer so concerned about it as if that is what is important. The focus is no longer on it wanting to change it, wanting it to be different, feeling any sense of de like dependency on it or identification with it. It's just there as the backdrop. Just there as the backdrop. And I think for myself, just over this journey, these last years, there were periods of years where I didn't have a home, I didn't have a base. And I feel that that was 
like part of Jesus's plan with me to uh, lift my mind from the sense of feeling this identification with home being in a place in this world and and learning to just keep putting this faith and this trust in the Holy Spirit and being shown that everything that I needed would be provided. And I noticed what would happen if I started to get a sense of, oh, I live here now, this is my home, this is where I'm going to be for a period of months or you know, years. And I would notice what would happen with the direction of my thinking when I would get that sense. And it was amazing to watch the subtlety of how I would then want to change the form. I'd want to improve it. Oh. But if I felt that I was just here temporarily, and I was here and the focus was on, I'm here to serve God, I'm here as a miracle worker, I'm here to be of service in whatever way you would have me be of service, when my attention was on my function, oh, that didn't even enter my mind. Like if you go to a friend's house, you don't go there thinking, oh, well, I would redecorate your house. <laughs> you just don't, you know. You go, oh, okay, that doesn't work very well. Or, you know, if there's something in the bathroom that could be improved or something in the garden that could be improved, you just, those thoughts don't even really come into your mind. But when it's your own house, when there's this sense of ownership or identification with it, it's like the mind wants to improve it focus becomes on the form, similar to the body. You know, when the identification is with the body, this is my home, this is my identity, then of course the attention and the mind is going to have thoughts there of improving it, wanting it to function better, wanting it to look better, you know, as opposed to having that focus be on so fully on the mind and so fully on our function and on service, that we're constantly being lifted up into a different realm of thinking and a different realm of identity. And forgiveness is the way to that the you know the sense of a of a self of an identity that's not purely free as an idea in the mind of God you know, is loosened up and so I like to speak on forgiveness because forgiveness is also very practical as well as being working with the mind there's often a, a component um, such as service which is very very helpful for practicing forgiveness. So, for example, the like the I need do nothing section in the course, um, where Jesus is describing, you know, I need do nothing. And I know for some course students have come across that section and had quite a bit of confusion and, th and thought, oh well, I need do nothing at all. And it can almost stop them in a sense of um, feeling that there's some movement or something that they can step into in their function. But he goes on in that section to say there, yes, I need do nothing to, to be who I truly am. And yet he describes that there is a quiet, still place within. And he says, from this place, you will be sent on many busy doings. So even though I need do nothing in the sense of personal responsibility, I need do nothing, from this quiet still place, you will be sent on many busy doings. And the purpose of these many busy doings is to heal your mind. It's to bring a blessing. It's to be of service to the Holy Spirit. And within this gift of being used by the Holy Spirit, you're being lifted into being identified with that which is truly helpful, 
That is our true nature. That is the presence of love or the Holy Spirit within our mind. And there are so many opportunities that are given every day to be helpful, to be of service, to just offer some kind of support which keep lifting the mind you know, up into the focus being on oneself and even trying to heal oneself, trying to process oneself and wake oneself up into being of service to and joining with a purpose that is already in direct connection with the Holy Spirit. And you could call that practical forgiveness. I think another word for service is forgiveness in action. When I first saw Mother Teresa pouring a glass of water, I saw God in the pouring of the water. I saw the presence of love and I could feel the presence of God in the simplest act of pouring a glass of water for a starving man. And his eyes beamed <laughs> in recognition of the love that was being given him in that moment. It was so far beyond the glass of water. And that forgiveness and action in what she was engaged in was, was her own opportunity to be identified with Christ and to offer this blessing in the moment to be received by her brother. And these opportunities come to everyone. And in fact, not just these opportunities for the holy encounters or, you know, offering, um, if it's on your way, you know, but just offering the gift if something's already on your way to extend it to another. But also in going about you know, daily life to practice with being with the presence of the Holy Spirit in every moment. Like I was describing uh, in the second episode there about even something like being in the bathroom, you know, brushing teeth. Who am I with while brushing teeth? You know, is the ego, am I on those strings of the, the ego and there's some push and it's all focused on the body? All my mind is just elsewhere and I'm just not even here at all in the moment. Or am I actually here in this moment, giving myself the opportunity to be with the presence of Christ, with being aware in the moment of who I'm with? And this is also forgiveness. This is forgiveness of the ego's purpose with what you're doing. So it's very, very practical. This is how we undo that separate self with that motivation of underneath it there's self-hatred. No. There is a sense of a self that's separate from God and there's a push behind it. It's very unloving. No. And that is being forgiven every time you bring the purpose of what you're doing into full awareness and give it over to the Holy Spirit in the moment. And that's what we use here in community no, cooking. Who is it that's cooking in this moment? No. Sweeping. Who is it that's sweeping right now in this moment? No. Is it in service to Christ? Because we're so worthy of being in service in every moment and using whatever it is in the moment to forgive to forgive the ego's purpose, to forgive this identity, if that's what's up. So I just feel to open it up now and see if anyone has a question at all about forgiveness or mystical experiences or Anything in between that's related to this?
Good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Thanks. Kay. Yeah, um, I am that I am. That awareness that you're talking about, uh, getting to be that all day long in that awareness of that. And um, what, what is the Holy Spirit? This is kind of a redundant question, I, I know, but mm -hmm. I can't. And my little mind wants to put it into something. Oh, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very good. It's a good question. The Holy Spirit is the bridge to knowing I am that I am consistently. So you could say the Holy Spirit is the stepping stone or the bridge. It is that which can be linked with, um, linked up with and called upon and prayed to um, while there's still this development of trust and uh, shift of identity, transformation taking place in the mind from the separate self or the self-concept to that full um, awareness of being in that I am that I am consistently. So. The Holy Spirit is like a light in the mind um, and it's described as the voice for God. Really it's the light, it's the reminder of that presence and yet um, it is able to take the form of words. It's able to take the form of um, whatever is truly helpful to meet the mind where it believes it is and to be able to be joined with. And I think the most um, important function that the Holy Spirit has is that it is a helper. The Holy Spirit is the helper. He is, you would say, a direct communication um, of a reference point that is beyond this world. Because in some um, spiritualities, there, where there isn't the sense of the helper or the guide, then there is just the sense of the ego and awareness or the I am presence with nothing in between. But with A Course in Miracles, um, in this sense, it's quite unique in that Jesus is always pointing to the Holy Spirit as being the guide. He's always saying, ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need. The Holy Spirit will give you the words you know, and the thoughts and remove the obstacles. So the Holy Spirit in that sense is, a ver is just a light in the mind, but in, it's, you could imagine it to be a really helpful friend who knows, you know, is the one who knows. And so everything that's confusing can be offered over to the Holy Spirit and then His help can be relied upon you know, in a practical way to show the way as opposed to just saying, I want to be in awareness and you're either in it or you're not. You know, but there's nothing really in between. Whereas the Holy Spirit is like this in-between bridge that is very, very supportive while this tra transformation is taking place. In the non-duality, and I know the Course is giving us this leg up kind of thing that is not the I am. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe I just, I don't understand. It's fictitious, right? It's actually just... that greater self, that higher self that is Yeah, I, I would say the whole, that's okay. Uh, I would say that 
um, this entire world is fictitious, <laughs> you could say. And so what is real? You know, what is real? What is of value? What, what is actually going to help the mind um, shift from it all being fictitious to knowing, knowing reality? And so you could say that it's all concepts in that sense. And yet, what is meaningful and what is of value is what will um, support the awakening in a very clear way. And in that sense, the Holy Spirit is not fictitious. The Holy Spirit is a solid, valuable, meaningful source of help to a mind that is completely disillusioned and delusional to be identifying as a separate self in this world. And so in that sense, valuing the Holy Spirit as a source of help and as one to turn to, rather than relying on one's own self, is very, very important. Because one's own self can just start to develop another self-concept, a spiritual self-concept, uh, you know, a more advanced self-concept, a better whatever self-concept. Whereas the Holy Spirit is, is more one that can be turned to in humbleness. Uh, when you're actually turning to a source of support, you're admitting to yourself, I need help. Uh, and in the willingness to ask and be shown, rather than depending on one's own sense of um, even knowing a, about how to use spiritual practices, then that willingness, that humbleness, that open-mindedness opens your mind to receive you know, the support and the help and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And then the identification eventually does merge with the Holy Spirit to knowing yourself as that wisdom, as that, as that truth and as that presence. But the journey is very much about bringing the illusions to the truth, including the self-concept. And I would say every step along the way on the spiritual journey, it's so humbling. You know, it's so, so humbling um, to continually be aware of the asking for help. But I can tell you that even when you become consistently happy and consistently aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your mind, then there's still the sense of childlike openness to receive constantly, you know. So it's not as if even the direction of that willing to be humbleness ever changes. In the end, you're becoming like a child, you know, back, you know, in your father's arms or back into that I am presence in which there is nothing but, but openness. So, yeah, I feel like it's a very, um, a very good question and a very important point. And and um, in my experience with, you know, some friends who've been into non-duality, they they've reached a point of really struggling because they don't have the source of of practical support to yeah to call upon. And I always feel so grateful to. Yeah, to have this sense of the one to turn to in the mind. Um, and I also want to say that A Course in Miracles is a non-dual teaching. Um, I would say it's the ultimate non-dual teaching because it's extremely clear about the nature of the dream versus reality. There is absolutely no confusion in the Course. The dream is the dream, and everything that is perceptual is the dream. And that is so clear. No, there's no confusion that love created the world of form. God created the universe. And it is a universe of thought with a capital T. It is not a universe of form of separate images. God did not create the world of images. And I've heard in some non-dual other teachings uh, as if the world of form is God's creation and if that is believed then how could you forgive what God created no. how could you turn to the Holy Spirit and say help me forgive what God created how could God be in need of forgiveness no. 
it, that just couldn't resonate as true. It must be that there is a, a universe of thought, a universe of pure awareness of love, of abstract reality, of spiritual reality that is behind the perceptual realm. And as this is forgiven and the mind is loosened from identifying with it, then it softens and softens and fades out of awareness until the experience is, uh, is so solid that I am the dreamer of the dream, uh, unaffected by the dream, not needing anything from the dream. So thank you for your question, Kay. It's, um, thank you, Kirsten. Yeah. That was very, very good. Yeah. Uplifting. Oh, good. Thank you. Hello, Kristen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd love to, to talk about uh, the mystical experience in, in itself. Uh, something very strong is blocking my way. Uh, uh, something around the fear of losing myself totally. It's very strong fear, uh, kind of a panic uh, when I go through the, to the mystical. Yeah, I think that's where, as I was describing service, you know, is, is a very helpful way to strengthen in the awareness of your true identity as spirit. And it's, it's very helpful to have these strengthening experiences because then when you do have a contrast experience, when there's darkness arising or there's a, a surrender and forgiveness, then there's also an awareness of the spirit that's there as well. So I think that's a, a, helpful, um, a helpful direction for your mind is to just keep being in prayer around the desire to be truly helpful, the desire to be of service to the spirit um, and trusting that that will continue to wash like an association that you have with the mystical as being dark or being fearful. Because some of the, the loosening experiences there is fear that comes up um, but they're not always fearful and so I think just also having that like the contrast experience of the simplicity of the joy of being of service can be a helpful direction. I've jumped to that uh, because the notion is, I, I know the notion, I, I, I already jump into this service mm -hmm. I, in a community, it was, but it was just, just I was there, I, I was doing whatever I could, like this notion of karma yoga, you know, the service, uh, and s something was still uh, not right. Yeah, it does, it does just take a lot of washing and welcoming, you know, and allowance and, and sometimes patience is required. And, you know, that's, that's been a very similar experience for many people who've come and joined in with this community. There's an idea of what it would be like to be in community and there's an idea of it, and yet it's not always the experience immediately, you know, or it's not always um, what's there because there's there's other blocks in the mind, or there's still an identity there that's that's in operation, and and so it's just step by step, moment by moment, and and also being very patient. I think just trusting that there is a, a loosening happening and if you just keep offering your willingness that's the most that you can do the willingness to be of service and the willingness to to forgive and allow and and open up and trusting then that the holy spirit is actually the one who's let's say in charge of the whole healing 
And for me to be told that at the beginning was very, very helpful because I was used to thinking I was the one in control of my life, you know, that I had the power to you know, do what I wanted and make myself happy. And, and when it came to this awakening, I realized that I'm not the one in control. No. I can't personally make myself be the way that I want to be. That's still an ego sense of, you know, trying to lead in some way. It's a constant coming back to this humbleness, you know, and all you can offer is your willingness and trust that, that there is a transformation taking place, you know. And if you're asking and you're willing to listen and follow, then you're doing your part. And I always think of like the, the mystics and the saints, you know, they would go off into caves for decades. Decades. Yeah. So this desire to awaken is beautiful, and yet the time it takes, you know, the, the process and the undoing is not something that there is any personal control over. And if there is any personal, you know, pushing or wanting, even for an outcome of some kind, then that is going to simply block our awareness of being carried and shown by the Holy Spirit moment by moment. Because it is very much a surrender. It's very much a surrender. So I join with you in, in the trust, you know, in the trust that what you have experienced and brought to the light so far has all served you. And what you're bringing to the light now and your willingness now is also going to serve you. And every moment that you were willing to be of service was received. You know, your willingness was received by the Holy Spirit. And so don't be disheartened that you've maybe tried something and it didn't seem to work. It's more just staying so open to what is it now, Holy Spirit? Oh, I'm willing to be shown. Thank you. Mm. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a deep journey. Okay, I think we have one more question there, Kathy. Yeah, she actually did type a question already. I can okay. read it. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, question is, when we trace upsets back to the core beliefs, what do we do with the belief after that? Just offering it up to the Holy Spirit hasn't seemed to be sufficient to release it. Okay. Yeah, the process of inner inquiry, there's another layer, basically. When you get down to belief, that's, you're almost there. <laughs> And, uh, but there is another layer beneath beliefs is desire. And so it's very helpful to get down to the layer of belief and to see what are the beliefs that are operating in the mind and to like get all of those up and clear, cleared out, like bringing those to the light. And then underneath belief, there's a wanting. And if you can identify the wanting, what is it I want? And let it be egoic in the moment. Actually, what I want is, you know, and what my expectations are, and what's happening that I don't want, like let those, the core of that wanting and desire become up and be very obvious in your mind. And when you can see that, that what you're wanting, what you're holding on to, is part of what is causing you pain, then you can find the willingness to to desire to let that go at the core and that's when there's there's a release that's when the forgiveness happens i think you probably answered this already in so many <laughs> so many ways but um i still am having trouble trusting i um about eight and a half years ago my life completely unraveled and it, against my wishes, I ended up back in Southern California, living with my mother 
and my mentally ill brother in this tiny little house, um, working, you know, at a job that's not particularly fulfilling in any way, being in traffic, um, very isolated um, from spiritual family. Um, how do I discern if this is really what God wants for me all these years later, or if I'm not hearing the inspiration to make a change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is in your best interests is deepening in your relationship with the Holy Spirit or with God. And so what stood out to me when you were sharing just then was when you said, I moved here against my wishes. So there is something in that that um, is not in alignment. Because the ultimate goal and where this is all leading to is realizing that my will and God's will are one. That's the experience. When you come into living in that experience, my will and God's will are one. I am listening and following every moment of the day. His will for me is perfect happiness, and I'm in it. Like, that's the alignment that we're coming into. And there is a, a lot of, of uh, seeing where there are conflicting wills and where my will is not lining up with God's will. Um, is You could say that's a big part of the journey. So when you said it's not my wish to come here, but I'm, I'm coming here, there's some kind of split in mind to feel like you're doing something against your wishes. And that's where it takes, that's where your inner inquiry needs to go to. And when you're asking before about um, getting down beneath the beliefs that something's not popping, I'm not coming into the inspiration just by seeing what I believe here. I'm still stuck. Underneath belief is desire. And to even have gone where you've gone and to South Carolina and feeling like it's not your desire to go there, but you're there, then that is very clearly that you're, you're experiencing compromise right now. And so I would say if you can spend some time with that and really look and, and get radically honest about the motivations in your mind and the desire in your mind and the wishes and the wants and some of those can take the form because remember they can be egoic we want to see all the egoic desires and wishes you know and personal responsibility is huge that's a big part of what we think we want but tied in with that wanting is also personal responsibility and guilt. You know, I want others to be happy. I want others to know that I'm with them, that I love them. There's a lot of wants that are in the mind that are not in alignment with um, God's will for us. And that's where the split is experienced. Well, I want the peace of God and I want, you know, to be with those who need me even if I'm not happy. You can see the split desire and the split wants so it's about bringing all of these to the light and you have to look upon them to bring them to the light and bring them all up into awareness. Yeah, and that's where you can do your inner work so that you can come into experiencing um, that you are exactly where you're meant to be. You know, when you're doing this kind of work, it takes you very deep into the truth in your own mind and then you can start to experience that sense of oh this is exactly where I'm meant to be and from that place of um, being freed up of the compromise then if there is guidance from the Holy Spirit to follow in a practical way it will be able to get through to you because your channel will be open you know of your mind Mm, thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. It's really important, yeah, to bring this to the light and just not hold anything back with wanting to see exactly what's going on, you know, in your mind with the desires and the wishes and the wants. Just bring them all up, you know, so they can be given to the Holy Spirit and then out of the release of them, you know, can be guided. So thank you so much, everyone. 
Bye. I love you. Thank <laughs> you.